Hey, everybody. Good afternoon. This is a crazy new thing we're doing today. Most of you know me. I'm your host, Benny Rose. Welcome to Press for Time. Today is actually a brand new segment that we're creating because, again, why don't I want to pile more things into my life instead of sticking <laughs> with one thing? I'll do 500 things. But today is truly a special day because it is not only a really awesome guest, but this segment that we're creating is something that is kind of helping gear into some of the future stuff that you're going to be seeing from, from me. So this episode and this show is called the Co Comic Book Co Creator Collective. I can't talk. So it's the Comic Book Creator Collective. The idea here is we are representing a chance to talk to a lot of the indie creators in the world. So it can be a comic book, a web comic. It can be all different types of, you know, ways to tell stories. And what better way to do that than to talk to the people that come up with them? And not necessarily some of these bigger platforms that, you know, you all know. Let's talk about the indies. Many know from several episodes over the of the last year or so, I put a big focus on indie because I truly believe that indie is where we need to put our support. And the reason for that is because everybody's established already. You know, like we're there. We know what we're inspired to do. The next generation's got to come in and become the driving force in not only comics, but in creative space, period. So what better way to do that than to have one of the coolest guys on TikTok right now? I have the one and only T.S. Luther. He makes comics. And if you haven't seen his videos, we will have links to them. What's up, T.S.? <laughs> How's it going, man? I'm T.S. and I write comics. Thanks for having me. This is an amazing opportunity. Thank you for being here. I, I truly... I've been so excited because, again, we've talked offline, but I wanted to let everybody know my feelings about TS. One of the biggest things is we have, you know, lived a life of craziness after <laughs> what, what, what we, the pandemic. Uh, you know, we always bring it up because the world changed, right, in so many ways. And it's not always a bad thing. But, again, I think that as we get older – People are trying new and different things to, to find ways to be creative. And many of you know, over the years, I've done different videos on uh, TikTok, Twitter, with me on Arcadia and stuff like that. And I haven't done them as much because I'm just not always in the same headspace. And I want it to be true from the heart. And sometimes I look for that inspiration from others. Fast forward to a couple weeks ago, I come across a video that's being shared by a fellow mutual in our space and i find a video of ts and it is just him being true to himself talking about his craft but talking about him as a person and i'd love if you take a couple minutes and let people know that maybe they're not familiar with you and tiktok a little bit about yourself and what you're about sure man uh like i said i'm ts and i write comics and i do that every single time because i'm a very nervous person i don't know how to start videos people think it's like a marketing gimmick but really it's me being afraid to be in front of the camera so i say that every time and i started a company called can't be killed creations i used to work at like a dead-end job i did a bunch of corporate suit soulless stuff and uh my wife encouraged me to quit my job to make comic books because we have two little ones at home who we love dearly. And the way that I grew up and the way that my wife grew up, we didn't know that doing the arts was a possibility. We didn't know it was something we could do. There was no one in our life who could pursue that. Everyone was just trying to survive. And she said, listen, we can probably make it work. Let's try it so we can show our kids that there's more than one way. So I quit my, I did the dumb thing. I quit my job and I started making comic books and uh, I didn't know how to sell them. I didn't know what to do with them. I put out a book called Growing Up. Um, it was like a little anthology series that was like never ending or uh, yeah, never ending story meets Toy Story. And uh, like I said, no one bought it. So I was like, what's this TikTok thing? COVID hit. Let's uh, let's get on TikTok. Let's tell people about my next one, which was called Tokyo Fire. Me and my buddy Sky, we made a book that was very cyberpunk, very inspired by anime. And I got on TikTok to sell it. And instead of just selling the book, which I did, we went to Zoop and we funded and everyone, you know, backed it. And it was really awesome. But I made friends. I found a community. I found other people who made comic books. I found a bunch of dads. I found a bunch of indie creators like you. I found a bunch of people that cared about the same stuff that I cared about and weren't jerks and weren't trying to just peddle their wares. They just wanted to make stuff. 
And uh, so that's what I do when I get on there and I give writing tips. The few that I know, I'm always honest. Uh, you can take tips from me, but I don't make a million dollars doing this. I barely break even doing it, but I have learned a thing or two. So I try to share it wherever I can. And from there, I've found some success. Uh, I'm getting published later on in 2025 by a comic book company called Invader Comics, a smaller publishing company. And so like the traction is working and people are responding to it. And so I try to give back as much as I, I can when it comes to my knowledge and every little thing I learned because the comics industry is hard, basically impossible to break in. So you got to go wherever you can and you got to meet people and you got to network and you get to do awesome shows like this and meet people like you. And uh, so, yeah, that's me. And if you have any questions, I guess I can answer them. I guess I can set some time aside. No. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. So I, I really have to commend you because again, your energy is something that I have been grateful to hear from other people about me sometimes, which is your energy is infectious. <laughs> and again, when I watch your videos, you give me that little spark that I need because I think we can all talk as a creative person. Sometimes we get down in the dumps. Sometimes we have imposter syndrome. Sometimes we question everything that we're doing. Is it, is it for nothing? You know, is, is this going to be something you know, and unfortunately, we always have to play the money game. You know, can I make money about this? It's like, <laughs> how many years can we spend saying it's not about the money? Because it's not about the money. You know, when you have a job, the job is about the money. This is like passion. These are passion yeah. projects that are coming from the heart. And again, we know that being creative can be successful. And I think the biggest differentiator on the people that find success nowadays is really how they approach the medium. You know, yeah. when you think about comic books, the idea, you know, I compare it to being a musician in a like traditional band. You know, yeah. I don't know if you've had that familiarity, but oh like, yeah, think I was about in bands all the way through, man. Like you're totally you you're spot on. This is how I compare it. So you're like, you know, for those that are not familiar, think about being in a band with four or five members. One person plays an instrument, another one does another. You guys write songs together. You go out, you practice them, then you have to go to record them, then you got to go out and play shows, and then if you have interest, you have to create merchandise. Everything comes out of your pocket in 99% of those scenarios. There's never really a guaranteed return on your investment. And then we think fast forward to the digital age, with music especially, you have all these platforms like Spotify and uh, Apple Music that basically the monetization practically doesn't exist. Right. You're getting paid on fractions of a penny for a play of a song. So even the thought of getting a million plays doesn't get you much, you know, in the in the form of money. When you have creators like TS, you know, we have to think about these things because we have to be financially responsible. We, we're adults, we have families, and it's a very tough subject to really go into because, again, you have to separate. But again, in order to be successful, you have to think about these things. No. And I think that your approach of going the crowdfunding route um, helps engage you know, your fans to know if they're interested or not. Oh, yeah. You know, we said it offline before. It's like, put your money where your mouth is. <laughs> you, how many people in the world of creative where like, oh, I love what you're doing. It's awesome. All right. Well, I have this coming out if you're interested. There's two ways of looking at that. <laughs> I can expect you to donate money because you're seriously committed to it. Or you just want to be supportive, but it's not your thing. Right. You know, there, there's that's a part that I don't think a lot of people think about. Because they just say, oh, you know, well, a band again. Oh, when you're playing next, you're not coming to the show, bro. <laughs> like, let's be honest. You know what I mean? There's that that fraction of people that show up. Right. And it's the same thing with our creative process. We get so engulfed in the passion. We're like, oh, my God, I have a physical product here. I could. Nobody wants it, you know, <laughs> and it's like it's not that nobody wants it, but we've we've lived the world where the norm is you get what's trending, you know, yeah. like if you're trending, people want it. And it's tough to find that, that, uh, that balance of accepting that, you know, or being the type of person you are, that's truly just engaging in the moment, being yourself, 
you're not pitchy. Like a lot of people, I feel that when they want to pitch, they're pitching by my comic, you know, like you're saying it without saying it because you're talking about yourself. You're putting yourself um, in a position where you're selling yourself, but you're selling the fact that even if they don't have the money, if they really like the idea, they're going to find a way to support you. Right. And it could be as simple as liking your video, reposting your video, which is how I found you <laughs> because of mutual reposted your video. And again, that's all it takes. So like, I'm just out there to put a little bit of a lesson for the fans out there that look for this type of creative is help the artists, not necessarily me, but yes, me too, but <laughs> help the artists by a button press. How many videos do we like of cats, of people falling? And, you know, like we all do it. We have the pinkies to prove it. For those that, are, <laughs> that know about the cell phone pinky, we doom scroll. We're all guilty of it, right? Let's be productive with our doom scrolls and let's help a supporter, you know, of a creative. It could be a musician, an artist. It could be a writer. It could be anybody that you're vibing with. You know what I mean? Like, not the world is all gloom and doom. And again, you you helped me remind me that the TikTok world is not all nonsense. You know, there's a great bunch of people out there that truly care about their craft, but also care about the people that are watching and listening and investing their time and their money. So I think that what you're doing is great. Please keep it up. And what I want to take a moment now is to talk about your projects. So sure. obviously you let us know a little bit about your earlier projects, but I'd like to maybe take a, a focus of attention on what you're currently working on so we can make sure if people are engaged with it, we can help support that. Sure, man. Uh, so Hellion and Bash is my newest comic book. It's funding on Kickstarter right now. Uh, it's the only thing under Hellion and Bash. So if you go there and type that in, you're going to find it. Uh, but it's a superhero comic. And I know you've seen a million superhero universes before. Everyone's launching their own superhero universe. But Hellion and Bash is a special love letter for me because I grew up with comics that had consequences and legacy. So that's the book that I'm making. No tie-in comics. It's issue one and it's going to go from there and i'm not doing a million other things to try to get you to buy stuff and the other part of it is it's not truly just a superhero story really at the heart of it it's a road trip story it's a father and son story and it's a story about victimhood because you have this main character here called hellion and he's the world's greatest sidekick he's the robin to this world's batman but this world's Batman is a bad guy. He is a monster and this abuse is happening and the superhero universe, their entire community is complicit. They let it happen because Batman saves the world. The gargoyle is the world's greatest detective. So yeah, it seems like he's rough on his sidekick, but you know, maybe that's the cost. And it's not until the supervillains step up, like this world's Catwoman, the super thief bash, uh, you know, says, Hey, that's not okay. I don't care that he does all these good things. I'm going to help this kid. And so they find themselves with the super villain in the superhero community at their back, chasing them down because they're messing with the status quo. And that's really the heart of the story because I grew up with a lot of people who didn't have anyone to care about them. There was a lot of victims who, because it would be really hard to help them, they were left unhelped. And uh, that's really what the story is about. And I tell it through a superhero lens. So that's the heavy pitch. If you want to just have fun, there's a giant monster that attacks the city. And while it's attacking it and all the superheroes are busy, you have the super villain, the super thief bash, and he's robbing stuff because no one can stop him because there's a giant monster attacking the city. No one cares that this guy is robbing them blind, but that's just the impetus. That's the start of the story. Awesome. I, I love it. And again, you know, you, we talked about this um, on a live briefly yesterday, the elevator pitch, <laughs> you know, and how much, how much time it takes to, to prepare that. And I think it's, it's a really, really interesting story and I love the art style as well. So I want to ask you when you're writing these stories, where do you feel you're deciding on what art direction you want to go? And obviously when it comes to picking artists and anybody that you're going to collaborate with, like where's your headspace in, in that regard of when you're ready to make those decisions where like, how do you do that? 
So I, I started from the very beginning. I'm a very visual dude when it comes to writing my scripts. I'm very specific for what I'm looking for as I write them. And I keep it all in mind. And I start looking for artists for the second I start the script. Sometimes even before when I just have the idea, I think about what that world should look like, what I want it to look like. And then I try to reach out to collaborators and say, hey, I think that you would be great for this story or that story. Uh, Tokyo Fire is a good example. That was my last book that I did. And from the get-go, I wanted this manga feel. I wanted a more anime-inspired, almost like Gendy Tartakovsky from early Cartoon Network look for the book. And so I looked for artists that had that appeal, that were doing that type of thing. So I do it from really early on. When it came to Hellion and Bash, I was looking for almost a Silver Age look to the book to get people in because it's a story that has superheroes, but it's not purely about superheroes. Um, so I wanted it to be as easy as possible. I, I, I cribbed from Invincible, right? When you look at the first arc of Invincible, you have this like Justice League parallel. They're just analogs. They're not necessarily important when it comes to their mythos. They're important because you know those characters. You see the guy who looks like Batman, he's like Batman. You understand that part. So I wanted an artist that could bring that to life. And I follow a lot of artists out of Brazil. I speak a little bit of Portuguese. And uh, I worked at a call center for a long time that was purely Portuguese. And so I followed a lot of these artists down there. And one dude who was making waves was Marcus Pedro. He had done a lot of stuff on their version of Webtoon. It's called Funktoon, an amazing app. Yes, you have to read Portuguese. Portuguese, but it's worth it. I'm telling you, amazing stories. And I saw his stuff and I reached out and I was like, listen, you're drawing some of the best superhero work I've ever seen. And you're not working at all in the US. Do you want to? And it turns out he was trying to break in over here for a really long time. It was just looking for the right story. So I pitched him three books. He picked Hellion and Bash and the rest is history. As uh, an amazing story. <laughs> And we've said it again offline. We'll say it for everybody. TS and I are finding we have a lot in common. <laughs> and when I tell you a lot, it's it's kind of scary. Because as you're telling that story, there is so many parallels to my creative space with the current comic projects that I'm working on, which we haven't talked about too much publicly yet because we're still in the process of things. But one of my artists is not in the U.S. as well. <laughs> Is also of Latin heritage. Heck yeah. Uh, we've worked together for about, I'd say, six or seven years. He is one of my primary artists for the band Neon Arcadia. Um, all the art you see for Press for Time, including our avatars, is done by this person, the one and only Juan Castellon. All right. So if he's on Facebook, if he cop pops in, brother, you know I love you. And we are really working on some incredible stuff coming forward, but li literally, like, as you're saying it, I'm just like, man, how much more in common can we have? It it's really, really cool, man. Like, this is like truly a bro down, you know, Heck yeah. like <laughs> it's, it's really cool. But uh, I love that, that that's, that's such a great approach. And um, do you feel that you may write a story that like is going to have a completely different visual dynamic based on that vibe? Like, because it seems like your two your two books that I've seen, um, the more recent ones, Tokyo Fire and and Hellion and Bash, a little bit of a similar aesthetic. You know, I know one's more cyberpunk, but I feel like the design scheme is is very similar. Like, and but I also noticed your original digital book, much more toned down. Like, <laughs> do you, do you have a preference on like what style you like to? portray your stories like no said, not at all i i okay. love keeping it as varied as possible uh every single story that i write i want like a different visual for it uh, i'm working on two books right now the one that's going to invader comics is called the digger basically what if indiana jones hunted short round is like the light pitch really it's about uh the dangers of academia and this lie that we've told where it belongs in a museum okay indiana jones was a grave robber and a thief he stole from cultures and put it there. The movies are awesome and I love Indiana Jones, but that's really, that's what we did, right? And so with that story, I wanted to go a little bit out there and I have a buddy, Sam Udalin, and he does very Gendy Tartakovsky looking stuff, very Cartoon Network, very early Cartoon Network um, aesthetics when it comes to the designs and really bombastic. And that's what I wanted for that book. So every single piece, uh, every frame of painting, every panel that he does in that book could be, a single shot from a cartoon so i try to do a different look for each of my books so i'm not pigeonholed 
Uh, you know, so I'm not like thrown into, well, TS writes the stuff that looks like superhero books or he writes the stuff that looks like anime inspired. I, I want to write everything. And the only way to do that is to make sure that people can see it, right? It's a visual medium. So I try to keep it varied. I'm working on a horror book with Immortal Coils, uh, Gerald Von Stoddard, an amazing artist, amazing writer. And that book looks like something uh, you would get from like Scott Snyder and Greg Capullo. It's very... Uh, dark it's very serious it's mostly human faces and a lot of character acting and it looks nothing like any of the other books i've done so i try not to repeat it now that being said i'm sure eventually you're going to see some stuff if i do more superhero books they're probably going to look like superhero books but for the most part i try to keep it as varied as possible that works and then also you think about your fan base too once you start growing that even more you know they might not necessarily expect, but kind of want a certain style for a certain right, story, right. especially if they want, you know, if they start asking you for a, a follow up to those existing stories or if they just want something else with that same vibe. You know? Right, right. Like, I think I think in the world of indie comics, the genres of not only the storytelling, but also the visual aesthetic is so varied. Like, you can do anything, you know, which is great. And I think that there's so much that you can experiment with too. Like again, working with being the comic uh, web comic I had years ago, we didn't have experience in that realm. So we knew the style that we can come up with and we just kind of worked with that. And we said, you know what? We're doing our own thing. It's not what everybody else is doing. And we went the web comic route because it was easier, you know, with time and everything. So we were like, all right, we'll focus on, we'll write a bunch of the stories but then like we'll create one strip telling like one joke essentially and we'll put it out like once a week you yeah. know and if we have to pass it on like we'll 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 do something else yeah it's and then some though. yeah you know and then what ended up happening is like we got very involved in like uh doing things that were like time sensitive yeah. so pop culture references in the world of video games became a very hot topic so I don't know if you uh, are a gamer at all, but are familiar oh, yeah. with the Amiibos and the Amiibo craze when they first came out. Uh, we really struck that <laughs> because we knew as collectors, but we also knew from the retail side what that was like and the world of scalpers and the world of, you know, um, modding them and all these other things and just the addiction. So like it was one of those things where like I wanted to tell a lot of stories but we got caught up in what was trending, you know, and you kind of, I don't want to say we got lost in the weeds, but that's a dangerous slope that like you oh, can yeah. fall into. Um, so in the end, by the time we were done where we like kind of just took a step back, there was a lot of stories that didn't get told, you know? So having that out of the box approach of doing something different, it's great because the fans that are out there want to see something different. You know, we, always have to think about, you know, not everybody can reinvent the wheel, you know, especially in the world of comics. <laughs> but if you're smart enough and you come up with a creative enough story, as we've said, you know, if people are into it, they're into it. Right. But again, the, the art is the art and the story go hand in hand. Like you can get lost in the first two pages. If you're not drawn in by both, essentially, it's like, Oh, this is a great story, but I'm not really like this. The visuals are not, doing it for me and that's that's a tough uh a tough balance to have especially if you're not doing both you know there are we have a, a lot of great indies in our in our circle in tiktok that do it all you know and it's crazy and i, I kudos you know but again you know it's the creative minds it's it's a, it's just a weird scenario but i love that we have that flexibility nowadays especially with technology so. I, really, and it's something that I talk about a lot when I give my tips is I'm a big student of the medium, and that's what I recommend to people if you want to break into writing of any sort, is to study the thing that you're writing. There's this, like, romantic idea that, like, if you don't look at anything of the ilk that you're writing, you'll be able to create something new. And really, in my opinion, what you're going to do is create something that's already been done before. You know, you need to study what you're doing so you can see how people have done it, how they've done well, and how you can improve upon it. And uh, I'm a big student student of like early image comics and honestly all image comics and one of the things that they perfected when they broke off and they just continue to do is uh that opening 
like segment, right? The first few pages, they would argue about it in the studio. It's like, well, no, you got to draw them in with just one page of exposition and then the rest of the book artwork or uh, how many splash pages can we put in the opening of the book to get people really in and then I'll explain and I'll put words eventually in it. Um, and that's where I learned how to do what I do specifically is I spend a lot of time on the first two pages because if I don't hook them in the first two pages, in my opinion, they're not going to pick up the rest of the book. I do indies and indie books are already an uphill battle. People hear indie, they think amateur. And really, we're still professional. We're just small. That's the thing. So I try to make it look as amazing and gripping and get as much of the cool stuff in there as possible, like Spawn, like Invincible. Eric Larson is a big one for me, right? So Savage Dragon. How can I put in a splash page or the most interesting looking page up front to get people to go, oh, hey, this isn't an amateur comic book. This is just a comic book that's not at Marvel, at DC, at Boom, at Dark Horse, etc. So it is, it's an uphill battle, but I, I, I really employ people who want to do this to go and study these things because I sound like I'm spitting out wisdom, but it's so obvious if you actually read comic books. You go, well, yeah, there's always a splash page on page two. Uh, but if you don't know, if you don't read comics, you might not see that. Very true. And I think the biggest struggle with that too is, you know, I think that let's let's go back. Uh, I don't know how old you are, but I I am forty two, <laughs> so I have been around. And you know, for those that are familiar with the show, I grew up in a comic book shop, and I've been around the world of comics my whole life. But I am not a traditional comic book reader. I don't read every book, um, but I've always had such a love for the worlds and the characters and the stories. Cause I find ways to get the stories told to me. My dad used to tell me about all of his favorites. You know, he would talk about his captain America love his Namor, And, you know, he loved the Mandarin and what a douche he was. And, <laughs> you know, like uh daredevil. And, you know, it was just really cool to see it from a different lens growing up now, looking back and, you know, how I just don't have the, I do a lot of things unconventionally <laughs> and it's, it's because of the way I was raised. And, but I will say that you're a hundred percent spot on with that because it's, it's like going to create music and never listening to anything. And then you pretty much get lost in the, when you make something, it's like, dude, you made a song that was released like 20 years ago and it's probably just in the back of your head and you don't realize it, you know? So it's, it's, it's definitely a, a scary aspect but I think a cool element of, of leveraging that along with doing your knowledge uh, research is finding something that you can compare it to. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of people get scared to compare yeah. because the first thing you think is, oh, it's another Batman book. Oh, it's another this book or it's another that book. It's like, like you said before, it's like you have a mix of Invincible. I don't want to watch Invincible. And then, people, you know, you're going to have those people that are going to get isolated. They're going to take it face value and they're going to walk away but i think it's important because a lot of people that are invested in stuff like that want more because maybe there isn't something out for it anymore or it's like a lot of those were inspired by other stories think about invincible invincible think about the cast a thousand percent. it's existing superheroes like it's a trope that you know we we all do it. We're all guilty of it, but it's we're inspired by it, and we want to do our own twist. You a know? thousand percent. It's what I always tell people. No one goes to Google and types in something that's not Invincible. What they type in is like other stories like Invincible. I don't think it's a bad word to compare. Be careful with what you compare to, because if you're not doing it right, or if you're setting up too much when it comes to expectations, you're going to let them down. I, I pick things that I think that if people like this, they're going to like that. That's why I pitch it like that. Yes, there's some clickbait of like, oh, you're comparing your book to Invincible, but I've never had somebody disappointed in what they read. They might not like it as much as Invincible. How could you? Invincible is freaking amazing. Right. Robert right. Kirkman is much better at this job at me. You can see that he's a very rich man. He's done it well. Now, does that mean that you're not going to like my book? No, it doesn't. What it means is you know which flavor that you're looking for, and maybe mine will fit just into that palette. And that's why I try to do it. I, I don't I have a problem comparing my book to those things because I, I've never had somebody be like, it's not as good as X-Men. You know what they do? They tell me, hey, this book kind of reminds me of X-Men. 
you know that and that's the fun for me because i love those things too so i don't i don't mind doing that maybe i have more confidence in my books than other people uh you know maybe like they're afraid to compare because they are setting up too big of expectations but i work really hard at this stuff and one of the best ways i've found to sell it is to say hey if you like this then you might like that and uh the people who yell at me about it are people that were never going to buy my book anyways and the people who defend me for that are people who found my book because of those and like it so i've never i've never been too mad at the people who are like ah how dare he do that I'm like you weren't buying it anyways it's okay very true we're always going to be a, you know be in a world where there's going to be trolls you know i'm looking at the camera because you know who you are <laughs> they're, they're they're all out there and it's okay because it's a counterbalance. It's it's one of those things like you know that you're getting some form of success success when somebody's giving you hate. <laughs> whether, whether it's for love or, you know, oh, I'm just joking with you, man, just busting your chops. Or it's like, you know, they just they're they're envious of yeah. what you're doing and they are they don't relate to it, whatever it may be. But I am an empath at heart, like to it <laughs> to the detriment of my core and really it's it's something i always worry about doing things in a public view of like uh you know how am i gonna take that person's gonna leave that that shitty comment you know but we have to grow with that and i fight with myself every day with that and you know when you get to a point where you have that that means somebody you you've you've gotten somebody's attention right with, without having to clickbait them in my opinion because <laughs> i feel like you know, the way everything is metric based now, you know, with you got to say Superman's the worst superhero ever, right. just so you just so you can get engagement. <laughs> I don't want to do that. You know, I can like get I, way more like clicks on my stuff if I say this new book is better than Invincible. And like, right. like that's not what I do. <laughs> right. I mean, there are people that do that for sure. Oh, for sure. You know, and, it, and their books probably sell more than mine. <laughs> but it's but it's a dangerous slope, and you have to you have to you have to be willing to to sleep in that bed at night and say that's the life that you've committed to. And I right. think that the way we are, we want to be true to ourselves, but we want to be honest. We're probably not good salespeople because we sell from our <laughs> own pocket, from our own heart. But again, the the people that support us are there. They'll always be there. And the more you do what you're doing, like speaking to you specifically, it's just going to grow from here because, like I said, your personality is infectious. But then you're also giving a service that, you know, people need, people need um, art in some form. But I always think about, you know, as a business, you know, what are you doing that's different than everybody else? And at the core of it, it's not the books. It's not the stories. It's the person that's behind it, especially in the world of social media, because we know that if you're not out there, you're nobody. You know, I've been doing this a long time and I've always had to do it piecemeal because <laughs> cliche. I'm pressed for time and I, but I've decided to build that brand around my life and know that I'm just on the slow burn of a journey. And I'm, I'm all about the journey. I'm not about the destination. I don't want to get there because then I'm not going to know what to do with myself. You know, I want to get to a junction where I'm like, Oh, now I could try this. or I could do this. And again, that's what motivates me. And I think finding people that are like-minded like yourself us bind, bonding together and us supporting each other is critical for the community to be healthier because again every fandom has toxic you know uh fandoms and i was talking about this yesterday um at new york comic con about just uh terrifier off like off topic <laughs> but terrifier is a ver a really popular pop icon right now that wasn't always that no. and it's it's crazy that what it is and it's a big part of that is because you think about it's horror one horror is always hard to sell but it's gory horror like really gory horror especially in the I, new one man like they, they right? ramped it up to 11 the new one yeah i just saw three myself and i'm like oh my god you know like i got a little desensitized by it but for sure we, we <laughs> see one and two in a million other horror movies but still i was like oh wow they really stepped it up man right and uh 
fortunate I, I happen to know the director. I know a couple of people that were in uh, a certain movie before Terrifier, if you're familiar <laughs> with the lore known as All Hallows Eve. I believe one of them is actually in our chat. I don't know if Rich Rampage is still there. He is actually one of my best friends and uh, a fellow musician we've done music with. He was actually in All Hallows Eve with the original Art the Clown fellow friend, uh, Mike. So I, from that same town, and I met them through through Rich. And it's just cool because I've known about it since All Hallows Eve to see where it's gone and how it's evolved and like literally we were talking about it because um a friend of mine has a wood art business there you go art the clown number three there he is i'm gonna My try man. not to be uh starstruck or anything it's fine everything's cool <laughs> i'm a duck on the pond he is rich is one of the the kindest friends i've ever had he's a huge toy collector like me um he's on tiktok as well i'm sure he'll follow you after this and uh but yeah, like it, it was just cool because like I remember like hearing about this movie. Oh, we're just making it in Staten Island. It's this, it's this, and this. and then it's like, oh, we finally we're gonna make a real one. And then, oh my god, like hearing it on the news and seeing it on social media is. But then, like the reason I was bringing this up is is because one of those things of you talk about popularity, you talk about doing things uh, for trending purposes when like Damien has stuck to his core of doing what he's wanted to do out right. of passion. Cause I, as far as I understand, he had a lot of really big opportunities for the third. We're talking like big, big money. And then once he pitched it, they're like, no, no. We're not doing that. <laughs> so he could have been one of two things, right? What he could have doubled down and be like, all right, fine. I'll do what you want. I want that money. He said, no, I want to make this movie my way. Somebody out there believes in it enough. And sure enough, that is what happened. And again, it's a story that not everybody gets to share, but it's inspirational because, you know, you always hear the success and then sometimes you'll hear the story later. Yeah. But you don't usually hear from people that know that person growing right. into it. Like, I don't know Damien directly like that, but I've met him several times and he's a great guy. He's true to his character as, as a person. And, to see somebody succeed like that is that's all we want for each other. You know, that's my thought. And I think that, you know, finding that success is a challenge, but we get to a point in our lives where again, it's, it's different time for everybody. You can hit it big tomorrow. I'll hit it big in seven years. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll have a Walker and somebody will be like, Oh my God, Betty Rose did this thing. Be like, Hey, I'm in a Walker, but I'm happy. <laughs> you know? I will but happily again, sit there in the rocking chair with you and talk about how we finally made it, man. Like that's uh I'm completely fine with that. We will schedule that Zoom meeting right now. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be in our embedded chip phones, it'll be in our skull. <laughs> you Terrifier we five that? will be out and it'll be like, hey, we were there from the beginning. <laughs> it'll it'll be art versus Freddy. Like it'll be just like crazy mashups. Because it's getting to that point. I truly believe that. And Damien, I doubt you're watching this, but you know, you have so much love and respect for me with everything. And Rich, it's really cool to uh to have met him through you and, and that you were a part of that awesome journey. And funny enough, our guitarist, our mutual guitarist, did some music for All Hallows Eve also. So there's a lot of a lot of combined uh things there. But I I, I didn't mean to get sidetracked. I just That's thought okay, it was man. Dude, really I love cool. that stuff, man. I'm a huge yeah. fan. Like you talk about doing video games. I wrote for a video game website for a while. Like I love all of these things. So I'm like, I, the problem I'm gonna have is I'm not gonna cut you off. And I'm like, yeah, please tell me more. Tell me more about your cool friends. <laughs> well, listen, I think we both have some really cool friends because I see that you, you know, when you're posting and connecting with other uh, fellow creatives, I like you to actually take a minute if it's cool because I know we got to wrap it up shortly, but uh. Let me know about some of the collaborations you've done on the TikTok side, because I know I believe you work with Fish Comics and some of the others. Like I knew of them before you, which another great person in the scene, which is awesome. And uh, like, how do you feel about collaborating with other writers? And is that something you enjoy doing? 
I enjoy working with anybody who's going to let me write. <laughs> like, honestly, it's, it's such a, there's a little bit of a low bar for me. Like, if you're nice and you want to write something with me, I'm in. Or if you want me to write something for you, I, I just love doing it. It's one of the only things I'm good at. So I say yes to a lot of things. But some of the best, like, working partnerships I've had are with people like Mr. Fish from Mr. Fish Comics. Fish Lee is one of the nicest dudes working in comics, indie or otherwise. And he gave me one of my first opportunities to be in somebody else's book. And from there, we enjoyed writing together so much that I do a lot of story consulting for him. I'm actually writing a few of his main series now because he's got a bunch and he can't do it all. So Fish is a big one. Go check out at Mr. Fish Comics. Uh, and then Lucky 33 Comics, Alex from over there, a uh, good friend of mine, one of the first people to hire me to just write a series for them. So I sold them a script this summer. Uh, that's going to tie into the new Luminaries, if you've heard of that. If you haven't, go check it out. One of the most fun and happy comic books I've ever read, and they're having such a good time over there. Um, another one is Colonel Jefferson, Rod, uh, at that nerdy Papa Bear uh, over there. Amazing dude. Uh, I've written a couple backup stories for his stuff. The list keeps going, but like those are three that pop into mind that uh, I love working with, and I've done like multiple things for. So go check out those three specifically. But I, I try to hire as many people as I can. I try to collab with as many people as I can on there because that's the whole reason why I've been able to do what I've done so far is getting on TikTok and people saying yes. Um, the dudes from the Gwazine, if you've heard of any of that, the Aerith saga, um, they were one of the first groups to go, hey, come on to our show and talk about your book. Um, and because people have done stuff like that for me, I've been able to get jobs and work for Invader Comics and a few other ones. And it's all because of that. So I love doing it. I, I get a lot of comments asking for specific advice and I always make videos for it or try to message. And I always tell people to message me if you have questions or want to talk about making comic books or, hey, I'm making one or I want to make one. What do I do? I'm not just like blowing smoke. Really message me. I will gladly talk about it. I will tell you anything that I know. I will give you any tips that you want. I don't like giving unsolicited advice because I'm an old white dude and I know that's what we do. So I try not to do that too much. But if you want help, if you want to talk about it, if you just want to hear more, please message me because I love comic books and I love that you want to make them. I've turned a lot of trolls in my comments uh, into fans and into comic book creators because they'll tell me something about how my book looks like crap. And I'm like, awesome, go make another one. There have been so many bad comic books that inspired me to do what I do right now. I would be happy if you hate Hellion and Bash and that makes you go and make the next Invincible. That's super cool and it doesn't hurt my feelings at all. Uh, just know that I will respond because I'm a real person and I will probably cry that you said that, but I will also message you and go, let's do it. Let's make a better comic book. So anybody really that's on there, I want to talk to you about making comic books, but those are my friends that I have and uh, I'll keep going until you stop me. So I'll stop myself. <laughs> no, it's cool, dude. Listen again, this is, this was a really important show because again, it's not, it's not something that we haven't explored on press for time. Because we've we've been very fortunate to have some great artists and comic creators on this platform, but we haven't really put it as a focus, and that's where I want to do with the segment. And I think you were the perfect person to start it off with. And I think that again, the core of this is really getting to know the mind behind what the craft is. A lot of times, we'll pick up a book, we'll pick up pick up a game. How many people are really invested in the person that makes it? Right. You know until they're here <laughs> you know yeah. like you are i feel you're established and you're to a point where people know who you are and it's only going to grow from here unless you i put have out tens the of <laughs> fans man almost 20 of them and, and you know what and all of them will come after you if you keep talking crap about me uh, Very but, true. <laughs> but yeah, I like established might be putting it strongly, but I do have some people and I will gladly tell my life story. All you want to hear it, have me on again. I'd love to keep chatting and, and do more of this, but also know that I named my company can't be killed creations. Cause I'm not going anywhere. Uh, you're going to watch me fail a million times and I'm just going to keep coming back because uh, I, I'm not in my 40s yet. I'm, I'm 31, but my knees are 55 and I have two kids <laughs> and like I want to show them that if you don't give up, that there's a possibility for you. So I, I'm just going to keep doing it, man. Like I, I, uh, 
I, I might not make it to Marvel or DC or something like that, but I get to work with amazing companies like Invader Comics. And honestly, that's that's crazy enough to me. I didn't think I'd sell one book, let alone get published by a company. So uh, every little thing that happens to me is a win. Being on this show, like uh, I don't know how many fans you have, but I'm a fan. So being able to be on here, talk to the, the, <laughs> Art the Clown, like I'm trying not to freak out, but I'm like, that's just so rad to me. This kind of thing is, is amazing to me. So so this is a huge win. I'm going to go tell my wife about this. Like I was on Johnny Carson, which is a dated reference because we're old. Uh, but like this, this is a win for me. This is a big deal. So every little thing that happens is amazing to me. I already made it, you know. It's it's such an awesome mentality and truly thank you for the kind words. It's really appreciated. And I'm glad that we can connect. And I, I think that there's a bright future for both of us. I'm very motivated by that. And who knows, you might see us working together in the future. Heck yeah, uh, man. So I will let everybody go with that. TS, thank you so much for your time today. I truly appreciate it. And I hope everybody will make sure to go back to YouTube. You know, I know we're live right now, but we're going to have this hosted for anybody that's working that can't check it out. We're going to have all the links to all of his pages, including the Kickstarter. Go and check it out. Listen to the pitch if you missed it here. It's, it's it's an awesome pitch on both sides. Take a moment. If you're into this style of comic books, I think you'll really dig it. And uh, I invested. I believe in him. And I think every little bit helps. So Thank I'll you leave so you much, all with man. that. And remember, everybody, take care and have fun.